Okay, and so it just told you that it's recording. Okay, and I presume that you can be recording at the same time if you wish to. Okay, and now I'm going to flip to share screen. Okay, and now I'm going to open up the PowerPoint. Okay. And we're going to stay in this big mode unless I need to do some other stuff. And at some point when I stop, um, I'll get out of this size mode maybe. Okay. So the other reason that I also like this format and I liked big blue button when I taught in medical biochemistry from here, I guess two years ago, is I have a pad on my desktop that allows me to write on the PowerPoint. So I'll be able to do equations, um, underline stuff. So we're meeting on Tuesdays. Uh, that all needs to be, oh, this is, I guess, a leftover from that lecture. We're meeting on Tuesdays and we're meeting from 10 to noon on Tuesdays, okay? Um, all of you know where my office is or you don't know where my lab is. Uh, if you need to come talk to me, we'll just wear masks when we're doing that. And you all know how to contact me through my email. Okay. And so this is the stuff that will end up being posted as an MP4, probably in Canvas. Um, I also have been putting this stuff out on uh, YouTube. Okay, <clears throat> so let's begin this as a basically as a lecture. Okay, and I guess everybody is still there. All right, so um, yes, everybody is still there. Okay, so when I give this as an introduction in medical biochemistry, I simply give these as the objectives. So we want to understand what pH is, that's a definition. We want to under, understand the value of using weak acids and bases, proton donors, proton acceptors to regulate the pH of a solution. Um, we'll derive the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and solve problems with the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And we'll discuss the role of buffers in pH balance and regulation. In medical biochemistry, um, we primarily end up talk, discussing this in the context of enzymes and in the context of hemoglobin. Um, in this class, we're simply doing this as an overview for um, skills that you might use in the lab, okay? Um, this reviews the kinds of things that are important in terms of protein structure and regulation, enzyme mechanism, um, acid-based catalysis, and then the regulation of hemoglobin in terms of the Bohr effect, that's a proton binding, and then oxygen transport, et cetera. And then this last part has to do with physiological. And the last part of that Seeger, Siegel chapter also discusses this in terms of physiological regulation of pH, primarily in blood. Okay. And we, of course, did the same thing in blood gases and medical biochemistry. Okay. And if need be, we can go back and review some of that. I'm not sure we'll need to. Okay. <clears throat> uh, So um, this lecture begins with discussing the importance of water, okay? And the fact that water is 70% of your body and what are the features of water that make it a unique solvent, okay? 70% of your body is sort of an overview. Um, it is different in every part of your body. Uh, I some books will tell you that plasma is 93%, okay? Uh, some books will tell you that muscle, for example, might be uh, 70%. Um, there are other numbers. I think red blood cells, <clears throat> RBCs, might be something like 80%. Uh, I'm rounding that number off. 
Um, and then things like bone um, might be a small number, okay? Because there's very little fluid in bone or cartilage. <clears throat> and so the amount of water in your body uh, will vary depending on what you're talking about. But in general, <clears throat> total weight, it's about 70%. The importance for that is, is that water is the solvent and that the solvent of water creates a very unusual environment. Water has a dipole because of its configuration. It actually has a tetrahedral arrangement with two protons and two pairs of electrons arranged in a tetrahedral electronic structure. This sets up a dipole where it's negatively charged down here and it's positively charged up here, okay? And that dipole then makes water capable of orienting itself <clears throat> relative to other water molecules, but also relative to other structures uh, in solution. So for example, buffers, salts, proteins, et cetera. <clears throat> so it gives water an unusual uh, adhesiveness or an unusual self-interaction. It's attracted to itself, all right? And so it gives it unusual properties, all right? That the very least pure water can hydrogen bond with four nearest neighbors. So these protons can hydrogen bond with somebody. These electrons can hydrogen bond with somebody, okay? And so that gives water this sort of self-interaction that makes its properties very unusual. One of the properties that it influences is it makes it a good solvent for certain kinds of interactions. So for example, sodium chloride is highly soluble in water because when it dissociates into a sodium and a chloride, it gets surrounded by water molecules that are oriented in a way Okay, oriented in a way so that the water favorably surrounds the chloride or surrounds the sodium and keeps them in solution separate from one another. If they're attracted to one another, they become this species and that precipitates. Okay, and so it's, so it's water in its ability to point or orient itself at charged substances that make water a good solvent. Now, Discussing water alone, water has an unusually high boiling point, an unusually large heat of vaporization, an unusually large melting temperature. And this would be relative to other things of similar orientation. So for example, methane, all right? And the reason that it has a high boiling point is that it likes itself, it's attracted to itself. And so it takes a lot of energy to turn water, the liquid, into water of vapor, all right? Or it takes a, a lot of energy to melt water because in the frozen state, it's heavily hydrogen bonded, okay? In this kind of fixed orientation and it takes energy to melt it. And so it's usually a fairly high melting temperature relative to other substances like methane to drive it from the solid into the liquid, okay? Um, we'll come back to the consequences of this for a lot of biological effects, but one of the consequences of this will be what we call the hydrophobic effect, where if you had a protein, and so that's a depiction of a protein, and on the surface of the protein, there were regions that might be highly charged and regions that might be hydrophobic, then what you would find is, is that water, would orient itself to the charges in a way that water is bound weakly, but nonetheless oriented towards the positive or negatively charged areas. But then it also might be oriented relative to itself. Excuse me, that's not what I want to do there. Let's do it this way. Around the hydrophobic regions, so that the water is in, this hydro, uh, is in this network of hydrogen bonding around the hydrophobic uh, regions. 
And that is sort of a, 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 a contribution to the energy of the system and the organization of the system. So there's some hydrogen bonding consequences here. So there's some enthalpy and entropy effects that we'll talk about, okay? And so water is an unusual solvent um, and it has therefore impact on the way uh, that it interacts with the molecules in our body as well as with the environment in general. Okay, so here are some depictions of what I'm drawing on the, the first slide there. <clears throat> Here's a depiction of water in a space filling orientation. Here are the lone pair electrons I'm just describing. And here is how water interacts with itself orienting around a water molecule. And it's not entirely showing it here, but it depicts it here in the frozen or ice state that water can interact with four nearest neighbors through hydrogen bonding, either a proton to an oxygen or an oxygen to an electron pair. Okay, and so it's this characteristic that changes um, or influences the structure of water and therefore its properties. Uh, it's melting, it's, it's, it's uh, boiling temperature, et cetera. Um, this is the other feature that I think I mentioned later in this slide showing water interacting in this case, I think that's with a chloride ion. And so you can see, oh, maybe it's a sodium ion because it's the oxygens that are associated with the sodium. Okay, and so you can see how water orients around the sodium and helps the sodium stay in solution. Okay, now beyond that ability to have a hydrogen bond with, with itself, water also has the ability to hydrogen bond with substances in solution. And the example that is shown here is hydrogen bonding to a carbonyl, either as a separate small molecule or as part of a larger peptide. Or you can have um, generally hydrogen bonding within the peptide between a carbonyl and an, and an amide that are in a peptide so that this is involved in part of the structure of the folded protein. Okay, and so now we're really talking about hydrogen bonding in general. Here we're talking about hydrogen bonding with water. Um, you're aware of the fact that DNA, for example, double-stranded DNA is stabilized by hydrogen bonding and that hydrogen bonding between A and T, for example, is these, are these two hydrogen bonds, okay? Um, and, and there would be three hydrogen bonds in a um, interaction with uh, along the double helix between GC. So GC would have three hydrogen bonds in its structure. Okay. So here's more details, and I've said a lot of this already, that water is a polar molecule and therefore polar molecules are readily soluble or dispersed in water because the polar polarity of the small molecule can interact with water and help uh, keep it in solution. Salts like sodium chloride, for example, will dissolve also in water because the water can interact through its dipole interaction with the charged salts. Ampipathic molecules, which means a molecule that has both a polar and a nonpolar group, can also interact with water. The solubility is a little bit less or a lot less than polar molecules. As long as the polar part of the molecule can interact favorably with water <clears throat> and overcome the unfavorable nonpolar interaction. Okay? And again, the water doesn't want to act with the oily part of the molecule. Okay, and so it organizes around the, the, the nonpolar part of the molecule. And so that costs some energy because of doing that, but it's the polar part of the molecule that keeps the amphipathic molecule in solution. Uh, things that are entirely nonpolar, entirely hydrophobic, will generally not solubilize in water and they'll form micelles or separate phases. Okay, and that's something that John Hostler has talked to you about a lot. All right. So 
Continuing with this concept about salts above, electrolytes in general will dissociate into anions and cations. So sodium chloride, potassium chloride will completely dissociate <clears throat> into their charged forms, okay? And the water will keep them in solution. Strong acids and bases will do the same thing. And so they will dissociate producing a proton or in this case, producing a hydroxide. Okay, weak electrolytes will partially dissociate. And all that really means is if you had some kind of a weak electrolyte, okay, this would partially dissociate to give you some kind of a negative charge <clears throat> plus a proton. And this partial dissociation will also help keep this, this molecule in solution, okay? And then the reference to sugars and alcohols down below, this would be something that has a hydroxyl, <clears throat> but then this can favorably interact with a water molecule through some kind of a hydrogen bond or through some other kind of interactions with other molecules to give it some kind of a solubility, all right? And so the general topic of solubility is sort of summarized in this slide. And we may do something more specific with this later on as part of another topic in the course. Okay, so here's the, so oh, it's a potassium ion. Sorry, I thought it was a sodium. A potassium ion interacting with water. Okay, <clears throat> so generally speaking, we're gonna talk about um, these interactions in our discussions um, throughout this course. And we're gonna do a lot more very specifically around these interactions. And we'll discuss them in the context of certain kinds of systems. But generally speaking, the kind of non-covalent interactions that we're going to be talking about are hydrogen bonding, electrostatic interactions, uh, Van der Waals interactions, which I've added down here, which are complementary hydrophobic surfaces coming together. These actually fall into a category that are known as induced dipoles. Induced dipoles. Okay. Or we're going to talk about the hydrophobic effect. Okay. And this is where two hydrophobic surfaces come together, squeeze the water out because these surfaces make van der Waals interactions, okay? And then the water being squeezed out becomes a favorable process because you gain entropy at a, excuse me, entropy at a cost of loss of enthalpy because the water is no longer bound to itself. But then you also gain enthalpy because the surface surface interactions that are going on in this space here. Okay, so generally speaking, when we talk about how proteins interact with one another or how DNA interacts with itself, there's a discussion of hydrogen bonding, electrostatic interactions, and the hydrophobic effect and the van der Waals contacts. This chelate mechanism is specific to ion interactions with multiple ligands, multiple carboxyls, for example, for calcium. Uh, calcium can have seven ligands, okay, in its interaction sphere, all right? And so there could be actually seven molecules that it's interacting with to hold it in its binding pocket in a protein, all right? And so it has a specific terminology because there are various binding partners in the folded structure of a protein. All right. So this is where we introduce now some of the mathematics of this process. And the mathematics of this process begin with just talking about water. All right. And so water um, will weakly dissociate into protons and hydroxides. All right. And that weak interaction is probably actually this interaction where two water molecules interact and make 
a hydrodium ion and a hydroxide. So what happens actually, mm, sorry. What happens actually, I can even erase, okay, is a proton gets donated to another water molecule. It makes this species leaving behind a hydroxide. In general, we'll shorten this to a free proton. There's probably no such thing as a free proton. It's probably a hydronium ion, okay? The overall equilibrium constant for this reaction is here. And notice we have written down the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactant, which is water, okay? And so this is how you write down in general an equilibrium constant. This is introduced in my notes that we'll look at next real quick and in the chapter by Seidel. <clears throat> It is known at some temperature, this is probably 25 degrees, uh, that the equilibrium constant is this number, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 16. In pure water, the water concentration is big. The water concentration is 55 molar, okay? So for example, <clears throat> if you have a thousand, grams in a liter, and you divide that by the molecular weight of water, this will give you 55 molar, okay? So moles per liter, a mole is the weight divided by the molecular weight. So it's a big number and it doesn't change. And so if we bring that water to the other side, multiply this out, 55 molar times that number, you get something that's approximately this number. And we can redefine this number as Kw. And so it now means the hydroxide concentration times the hydrogen concentration is one times 10 to the minus 14. Um, it's not always convenient to describe stuff as 10 to the minus 14. <clears throat> and so we can take P minus the log of Kw. And when you take minus the log of one times 10 to the minus 14, it's minus the log of one plus minus the log of 10 to the minus 14. Log of one is zero. The log of 10 to the minus 14 is minus 14 and a minus a minus is plus 14. And so it makes it more convenient to do P KW rather than to say one times 10 to the minus 14. Simply say PKW is 14, okay? Uh, I went over this in med biochem. <clears throat> if you have forgotten your logarithms for one reason or another, you need to practice this, right? Now, pH is minus the log of the hydrogen ion concentration. And this is coming from the definition of P. P means minus the log of something, okay? X, minus the log of X. So pH means minus the log of hydrogen ion concentration. But minus the log of the hydrogen ion concentration can be rewritten as the, as the log of the hydrogen ion concentration raised to the minus one, which can be rewritten as one over the hydrogen ion concentration, okay? And so I'm just really writing this out here to make sure you're familiar with the nomenclature and converting from one form to another form, okay? <clears throat> In pure water, hydrogen is equal to hydrogen concentration or hydronium concentration is equal to hydroxide concentration, all right? So since the product is, let me write it out here. Since the product is one times 10 to the minus 14 and they're equal to one another, then each one must, must be one times 10 to the minus seven because one times 10 to the minus seven times one times 10 to the minus seven is equal to one times 10 to the minus 14. 
you sum the exponentials, all right? <clears throat> now, if I take minus the log of the hydrogen ion concentration, or I take minus the log of the hydroxide ion concentration, shown here is pH or pOH, <clears throat> then each of them is seven. And if I take the log of a product, then it's the sum of the logs. So if I take the log of the hydrogen ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration, sorry, I'm not sure where that's coming from, then that's equal to the log of the hydrogen ion concentration plus the log of the log of the hydroxide ion concentration. <clears throat> and if it's actually minus the log, then it's the sum of minus the log. And minus the log of H is pH, minus the log of OH is pOH. If they're both seven, then it's seven plus seven equals 14, and that's the pKW. Okay, so all of this is really just remembering the math and remembering uh, logarithms. Okay, <clears throat> now this general equation, either written in the linear form or in a logarithm form, okay, as a product or as a sum, <clears throat> uh, is an equilibrium. And so what it means is if you change the hydrogen ion concentration, you necessarily change the hydroxide ion concentration. So in pure water, they're going to be the same. But in any other condition, if you change by some other mechanism, the hydrogen ion concentration, the hydroxide ion concentration must change to obey the equilibrium constant because this KW is a constant, whether it's written as a KW or a PKW. So if I change the pH to be uh, six, which is one times 10 to the minus six molar, minus the log of 10 to the minus six is plus six, then the hydroxide ion concentration must adjust so that six plus eight is equal to 14. Or that 10 to the minus six times 10 to the minus eight is 10 to the minus 14, okay? And so as you go down this table to more and more dilute proton, then you're necessarily going down this table to more and more concentrated hydroxide and vice versa, okay? These are equilibria. And so knowing the pH, you know the pOH. Knowing the pOH, you know the pH. Knowing the hydrogen ion concentration, you know the hydroxide ion concentration, okay? That is usually introduced at that point because we wanna understand how pH is used in regulation, regulation of biological solutions. As biochemists or as biophysicists or as biologists in general, physiologists or anyone else, if you're working in a bench top experiment, an in vitro experiment, you also wanna know something about the pH of the solution and how you regulate the pH of the solution, okay? Um, I didn't say this at the beginning. If you have questions, just unmute yourself and ask a question, okay? So the table that I show is usually this table involving blood plasma and these other biological solutions. Um, what we know is that the plasma pH is generally 7.4, okay? And so what that actually means is 40 nanomolar. And I think if I push a button, yeah, there it is, 40 nanomolar, okay? So 40 nanomolar, it's 40 times 10 to the minus nine, can be rewritten as four times 10 to the minus eight. If you move the decimal point here, then this number changes to minus eight. And then you can take minus the log of four times 10 to the minus eight. Minus the log of four is minus 0.6. Minus the log of 10 to the minus eight is minus eight. Minus a uh, minus is eight. So this is eight minus 0.6, it's 7.4, okay? So that's how you do log calculations <clears throat> for calculating the pH. 
The log of a product is the sum of the logs, the sum of the logs. So the interstitial fluid around the plasma is also in equilibrium with it, and it's generally 7,4. Intercellular fluids are generally more acidic, 6,9. The lysosome, because of all of the um, proteolysis that it does, is generally more acidic. And then lots of other solutions in our bodies can be more acidic or more basic. So for example, our urine can be more acidic or more basic. Our saliva tends to be neutral or slightly acidic. Our gastric juices, where we do a lot of um, HCL digestion of, of the food we eat is very acidic. Our pancreas is generally very basic. Okay. All right, so that is a general overview of biological structures and biological conditions. Um, so what more can we say about biological molecules or, or acid bases in general? So here's an example using lactic acid. So this is the, the, the structure of lactic, lactic acid. It has three carbons. It has a carboxyl with a dissociable proton. Okay, it has a hydroxyl that comes off of this carbon, okay, and has this methyl at the end. Okay, so the dissociation of this proton off of the carboxyl to give a conjugate base and a proton, we can write an equilibrium constant down for this expression, and you'll notice it's moles per liter in this nomenclature. It's the product concentrations so it's the proton concentration times the conjugate base that I'm just summarizing as A minus for an acid, but the minus, so it's a conjugate base, divided by the conjugate acid, all right? And so what I say down here at the bottom is, what if we had 0.1 molar lactic acid, and if this was the equilibrium constant, this was equal to 1.38 times 10 to the minus four. Okay, so I think I come back to that later. Do I come back? No, I solve it right here. Here we go. So the way you would solve that problem is, is that you would put an initial condition down and you would allow a certain amount of dissociation and you would generate X and X. <clears throat> the only source of the conjugate base is gonna be what's dissociated. And so they must be equal to one another. Next week, we'll talk about conditions where there are lots of sources of things like the proton and how you simultaneously solve multiple equilibria. Generally speaking, you don't make solutions up that are just lactic acid. You generally put other stuff in there, okay? So here's the equilibrium constant from the previous slide. And here's the value. And so if we plug values in, this is gonna be X times X, proton and conjugate base, divided by C naught minus X. So here's C naught minus X. And the, and the question was uh, 0.1 molar, all right? So the way you solve this problem generally is you neglect the, the amount of X relative to the initial. X is small, and so you can neglect it. And then you can take the 0.1 to the left, and that makes this 10 to the minus five instead of 10 to the minus four. And then this is equal to X squared. And then you take the square root of both sides. And this shows you that the concentration is the square root of this number. And so it's 3.71 millimolar. Okay, 3.71 millimolar. The question is what's the pH? Not the concentration. So it's minus the log of 0 0.00371. So notice, this is 3.71 times 10 to the minus three. So minus the log of 3.71 plus minus the log of 10 to the minus three. <clears throat> so this is three minus something, <clears throat> whatever the log of this is with a minus. And so it looks like the log of this minus the log of this, but the log of this is 0.57. So three minus 0.57 gives you 2.43, okay? 
So you add a weak acid to a solution. It partially dissociates. This is the equilibrium constant for the dissociation. It puts acid into the solution. So it makes the solution acidic. How much acid? It puts 3.71 millimolar in solution. Notice this species also has a concentration of 3.71 millimolar. Okay, this guy over here started at 0.1 molar. So that's 100 millimolar. And then you subtract from that 3.71 millimolar. So this guy is now something like 96 point, uh, what is that? 39, 29, I'm sorry, 29 millimolar acetic acid, 3.71 conjugate base acetate, okay, and 3.71 molar, millimolar proton, okay? So you can see how all of this is sort of a unified solution to the problem. So this is how you would normally solve the problem. If X was too big, then you would actually end up with a quadratic and you would have to solve the quadratic, okay? So you would have to know the solution to a quadratic. Okay. Ah, and then I also summarized down here that this dissociation represents 3.71% dissociation. Okay, so that's why we call it a weak acid, because only a small amount of it dissociates. If we were talking about HCl, 100% of it dissociates into a strong acid and whatever the counter ion is, okay? All right. So general features about weak acids and bases, the acid is a proton donor, the base is a proton acceptor, weak acids dissociate into a conjugate acid, conjugate base pair, the PK can be summarized as minus the log of the K. <clears throat> Examples are lactic acid like we just did. Examples of phosphoric acid, um, Conjugate bases can be this triphosphate, tri, uh, trip, triple negative phosphate. And then species like mono and dibasic phosphate can be either acids or bases. They can either react with a proton or dissociate a proton. <clears throat> and that's what gives them such versatility as buffers and how they're used in, for example, PBS in solutions in the lab or in our blood. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to summarize here that there are lots of different, <clears throat> excuse me, lots of different weak acids and bases that we will talk about in general in terms of buffering. In biochemistry, I usually introduce this as we're going to spend a lot of time talking about all the metabolites that might be involved. Okay, but generally speaking, you can generally you can write down this general form that a proton donor, an acid, will dissociate into its conjugate base, the acceptor, with a proton. Okay, and so this is the general equation, and then you can write down in general an equilibrium constant of the form that we wrote down in this previous equation, like this. Okay. And then there are lots of others that we talk about. And here I summarize the value of the K and the value of the PK. I think I usually emphasize because at this point in med biochemistry, we're trying to teach you to solve problems. You can see 10 to the minus six, it becomes five something because it's six minus something. 10 to the minus 10, it becomes nine something because it's 10 minus the log of 2.5, et cetera. Okay. So generally now, what do we do with this? And what we're generally interested in is not just how to make that calculation, but also how we use weak acids and bases as buffers and how we represent weak acids and bases and their buffering capacity. So here's the general reaction. Conjugate acid dissociates into a base plus a proton. The equilibrium constant looks like this, okay? 
if you invert the equation, so you bring the K to one side and you bring the acid to the other side, this becomes one over the proton concentration. This becomes one over the equilibrium constant. And it's multiplied by this ratio, the base over the acid. Then we take the logarithm of both sides. So the log of one over H is equal to the log of one over K plus, plus, no oh goodness, there we go, plus the log of the ratio. So the log of a product is the sum of the logs, all right? So the log of one over H can be rewritten as pH. Remember, this can also be written as H to the minus one, and then the one can come down in front, and this can be written as minus the log of H, and minus the log of H is pH. You can do the same thing here. This can be written as K to the minus one, the log, can be written as minus the log of K, that's PK, plus the log of the ratio, okay? <clears throat> so the Henderson-Hasselbach equation is a general equation that you can apply to any weak acid base pair where the pH is equal to the PK plus the log of the ratio, the conjugate base over the conjugate acid. <clears throat> so depending upon where you are in the equilibrium, you can determine what the pH is about its pK. Okay, And so this is written here in graphical form for acetic acid, where we plot the pH versus the equivalent of proton, uh, excuse me, of hydroxide added. And so what we're doing here is we're adding hydroxide to a solution of acetic acid. Remember, this is a weak acid, so most of the solution is in the acidic form, maybe 97, 98% initially. And then we're gonna add hydroxide in certain amounts. And by adding it in certain amounts, did I lose my pen? My pen seems to have disappeared. Really? Oh, well, there it is. <clears throat> add hydroxide in certain amounts, it will steal that proton and it will make the conjugate base, okay? So it will steal that proton and it will convert it to water, all right? Hydroxide plus proton is water, <clears throat> okay? But it will change the ratio of the conjugate acid over the conjugate base, okay? So in Henderson-Hasselbach, it'll change that second term. <clears throat> so at the pK, at the pK, go back here, at the pK, if these are equal to one another, this term must be zero. So this must be the ratio of one over one and the log of one is zero, okay? So at the pK, at the midpoint of this titration, half is in the conjugate base and half is in the conjugate acid. If you have more acid, then you're down here at low pHs. The acid form predominates. That's this species up, a up in the top. This species here predominates. And so you're on the acid side of the pK. If you're down here in basic conditions, you're on the basic side of the pK, <clears throat> okay? So if there's more acid, then this ratio is less than one. The log is a negative number. And so the pH is smaller than the pK. If there's more base than acid, then this is greater than one. The log is a positive number. And then it's added to the pK and the pH is bigger than the pK. That's the logic of that, okay? All right. So generally speaking, on the acid side of the pK, you mostly have the acid form. On the basic side of the pK, you mostly have the basic form. And it's reflected in that ratio. Now, generally speaking, this, this shape is due to the equation. And I think the equation is, there it is, is generally due to this equation. 
pH is equal to pK plus the log of the base over the acid. <clears throat> okay. So the shape shifts with the pK. So if this is acetic acid, for example, the midpoint's around 3.86, and this is the acid and the base side. But this obeys the Henderson Hasselbach equation with pK of 3.86. Ammonia has a pK of 9.25. And so below the pK here, then predominantly you have NH4, sorry, NH4, and above plus, and above you have neutral, okay? But the, mi the middle of it is still, the center of it at 0.5 is still one-to-one, -one, the pK. And this, these are the species that are involved in the equilibrium. <clears throat> Here, it would be the conjugate acid and the conjugate base would be predominant. Okay. Um, this is simply showing that it's a log expression. And so if you're tenfold more basic or a hundredfold more basic, the points shift in units of log. Okay, and so it's units, when you plot these as ratios in a log scale, everything is sort of a linear shift between units involving logs. Uh, and that's shown, I think, in this calculation. So let's do this calculation first and then go back to that. <clears throat> okay. The question that's being asked here is, the ratio of conjugate base over conjugate acid. What is the ratio for this reaction at pH 6.7? Now this reaction has a pK of 6.7, okay? So at 6.7, this is 6.7 is equal to 6.7, okay? That means the log term is zero. That means this is one over one. Okay, so at pH 6.7, the ratio is one to one, all right? The question then goes on and says, what about pH 5.7? Well, at pH 5.7, it's equal to the pK plus the log of the ratio. What log term gives you 5.7? And the answer is minus one. Okay, so minus one plus 6.7 equals 5.7, all right? What is the ratio if the log is minus one? Okay, the log of what is equal to minus one? And it shows down here that if the, the anti-log of minus one is one over 10, the log of one over 10 is equal to minus one. Okay, so the ratio is one tenth, or the ratio is 0 0.1. It's one part base, it's 10 parts acid. That's why the pH is more acidic, because there's more acid. Okay, so if the ratio is one tenth, the log of one tenth is minus one, minus one plus 6.7 is 5.7. <clears throat> okay, 8.7, it describes down here. 8.7 is equal to 6.7 plus the log of what? And the answer is 100 to 1 because the log of 100 is 2. 2 plus 6.7 is 8.7. Okay. Now notice 100, the log of 100 is 2. So on this scale back here, that's when you get to the log of 100. It's two pH units. In this particular case, it's right here. One two pH units bigger than the pK. So the ratio is 100, the log of 100 is two, two plus the midpoint, the pK is 8.7. Okay, so that's how you do all of that math. All right. So what I do here is a different way of solving that problem initially. If you have 0.1 molar HA, and if the equilibrium constant is 1.38 times 10 to the minus four, we would log, type in X and C naught minus X. 
This would be the log of x minus the log of 0 0.1 because we're going to neglect x. Okay. <clears throat> if x in this reaction is the proton concentration, then this is the proton concentration, excuse me, x is the proton concentration. Then we can substitute proton for x, and then we can bring it to the other side. And then this becomes pH. So we have two pH. And then back on the other side, we still have pK. Here's the pK. And we have minus the log of the initial concentration. So 2 pH is equal to pK, 3.86, minus the log of C naught. Remember, this is 0.1. Log of 0.1 is minus 1. Minus a minus is plus 1. So this is 4.86. Divide by 2, it's 2.43. And in the notes, we had solved this as the square root of something is equal to x squared. And that came out to be 2.43. OK. <clears throat> and this is that slide in the back yeah, previously. We had plugged in C naught minus X, X times X, neglected X, took the square root, got a concentration, took the logarithm, got 2.43. Dr. Korea. Yep. Why, why do we neglect, uh, why do we neglect that um, X in there where you are neglecting C naught minus X? Why do you neglect? neglect we neglect that? it because it's small. Okay. okay. If you don't neglect it, <clears throat> okay, if you don't neglect it, what you have is K equal equilibrium times C naught minus X is equal to X squared. So yeah. you now have a quadratic K equilibrium times C naught minus X times K equilibrium minus X squared is equal to zero. This is the equation you have to solve. Okay. <clears throat> By neglecting X, we don't get one of the terms and we can just solve by taking the square root. Okay, perfect. So yeah. this will work, but you've got to know the equation for a quadratic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Minus B plus and minus the square root of B squared minus... Um, I'm, I'm forgetting what the equation is over, over C, something like that. And so you'll need the solution for the quadratic if you don't do it that yeah. way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, what we were just describing were simple small buffers or simple small molecules like lactic acid or acetic acid. The point is, is that proteins and amino acids also have dissociable protons. And they often have multiple dissociable protons. So for example, alanine, you know this is alanine because the side chain is CH3. You can dissociate the first proton at the low pK from the carboxyl. And you will create this form that has double charge, okay? Isoelectric net charge is zero. And then you can dissociate the second proton with a pK of 9.1 from the amino group here, and now you have a negatively charged species at high pH, okay? And so there might be multiple dissociable protons, okay? And so that's what's shown here in that if you plot equivalence of base added, and so now we're forcing the protons off by adding hydroxide, and we'll go through the first pK around pH two, and then we'll go through a second pK around pH 9. And so you'll dissociate the proton from the carboxyl, and then you'll also dissociate the proton from the amino, and you'll have two dissociated forms. And this is showing the different forms. Here's the fully protonated form. Here's the partially protonated form. Here's the fully dissociated form up here at the top. OK. So these are also difficult calculations, if you are just around pH 2, you can use Henderson-Hasselbach and neglect this other reaction because it's so far away, this species doesn't exist, or it's a really low concentration. If you're up around pH 9, you can just solve Henderson-Hasselbach here, 
because this species is, is negligible amounts and you can ignore those species, okay? If you're in the middle, it might be two simultaneous equations. If you had um, the titration curve of something where the dissociable protons are closer together, stop it, closer together like that, then this region of the curve, you might have to solve two simultaneous equations. So if this was uh, glutamic acid, you would dissolve, dissociate the side chain, you would dissociate the carboxyl, the alpha carboxyl, and this would be a complicated calculation. You would have two simultaneous equilibria. If you had a protein that had 20 glutamic acids and 25 aspartic acids and 10 histidines and <clears throat> uh, arginines and lysines, then you would potentially have reactions that involve 60, 100 simultaneous equilibria, okay? And so those become much more complicated and involve usually not pencil and paper, usually involve computers, okay? And later on, I'll show you a piece of software that will do that for you. And I'll comment at the time that it's way more complicated than it looks like, okay? So it's simultaneous henderson hasselbach but it's also more complicated than that because all of those charged species might interact with other stuff. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so we then end here with examples of biological buffers and the one that we talk about at the end of this lecture is bicarb. And then we also talk about this example involving um, transport of drugs and where the uncharged form is transported and you wanna know what fraction is, untran is, is, tr is transportable <clears throat> by passive diffusion, all right? And so at this point in the course, remember we went off and we started talking about blood gases and we started talking about serum. In this case, we simply introduced this as a simple problem for solving uh, transportable or pharmacokinetic parameters. And so in this particular case, this compound is aspirin. It has a pK of 3.5, okay? Um, I think here's the structure of aspirin. Okay, so let me do it back here and then I'll do it in the next part. <clears throat> if the pK is 3.5 <clears throat> and in your stomach, the pH is 1.5. This is 1.5 is equal to 3.5 plus the log of the dissociated conjugate base divided by the conjugate acid, okay? <clears throat> so what would this ratio be? Okay, and so that's the question. Now, I think you can see that this number has to be minus two, minus two plus 3.5. So this ratio has to be 10 to the minus two. It has to be one over a hundred. So it's a hundred parts protonated. It's one part deprotonated. A hundred parts protonated, one part deprotonated. Okay, and so protonated form is uncharged. So it will passively diffuse. And so 99% of the molecules can passively diffuse. Okay, and so I resolve this problem down here and I come up with one over a hundred, the solution to this problem because minus two plus 3.5 is 1.5. And so 99% is uncharged in the lumen of the stomach, yes? Then I say, well, when it gets through there, it now is in the blood and the pH is 7.4. Now what fraction of the molecules are uncharged? Now what fraction of the molecules are in the acid form? So <clears throat> this difference is 3.9. So it's the antilog of 3.9. 3.9 plus 3.5 is 7.4. The ratio therefore is 8,000 over one. That means the fraction protonated is one over 8,000. 
That means the fraction is less than 0.1% uncharged. 0. 0.00013 for the AH form, AH form, okay? And then I go on to talk about this in terms of pharmacodynamics because a typical dose of aspirin is 350 milligrams. You usually take two of them. Excuse me, I guess an aspirin is usually 325 milligrams and you take two of them. So 0.01% dissolved in your blood would be 0.02 milligrams that are in the uncharged form and now they have to somehow get to their site of action. Their site of action is cyclooxygenase. Maybe the cyclooxygenase is on the surface. Maybe cyclooxygenase is readily available. Maybe 0.082 milligrams is a lot of stuff. And it binds tightly and it can inactivate cyclooxygenase. That's the other part of this. It's an irreversible inactivation. <clears throat> so every part that reacts is irreversible. And so that makes this clinically useful. Okay. So the rest of these are just calculations of various kinds. And we'll treat these as um, other things that you can review. Now I'm going to try to get out of here. Oh, I got to... No. I want to stop the PowerPoint. You want to change all the annotations and I'm going to say discard. Okay, and then I'm going to bury this guy, hide this guy. Oops. Sorry, my cursor and my pen are competing. It wants to reboot, so I'm going to close it. And then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to pull up these notes, okay? All right, so in medical biochemistry, these notes were sort of posted as um, things that you should look at to remind you of stuff. <clears throat> and a lot of what I did already sort of answers these questions, right? So the assumption is you know what a mole is and you know that one mole corresponds to the molecular weight of the substance. Okay, so one mole of water is 18 grams of water. And then you know that molarity means moles per liter. So one liter contains a thousand milliliters, which corresponds to approximately a thousand grams, 997 grams, because the density of water is something like 0.998, okay? If you divide by the molecular weight of water, this gives you something close to 55.5 molar. This is temperature dependent. There's water densities changes with temperature. So a one molar solution of water, a molar solution can, in each liter, a, a one molar solution are equal to the molecular weight of the compound. Oh, that's a general statement, okay. Um, there's another unit that we will maybe talk about, it's molality, which is not per liter, but per grams. There's another set of units that involve normality, which involves the equivalent number of protons or hydroxide ions. So if you have something that dissociates multiple protons, then it has a normality that is two instead of one, two times as much, okay? Um, and then we talk about simply preferences, pre uh, prefixes, excuse me, that you should know. You should know milli is 10 to the minus three and micro is 10 to the minus six and nano is 10 to the minus nine, et cetera, et cetera. So here's a simple table that talks about the conversion from grams per liter to molarity to normality, okay? So notice 72.9 grams per liter is actually, let me go back to my pen, two molar, because the molecular weight of HCl is around 36, okay, approximately, one plus 35 point something, all right? And so this is two molar, and it's two normal because there's one equivalent of proton, okay? H2SO4 has a molecular weight of 98, 
So if you had 98 grams per liter, it would be one molar H, H uh, sulfuric acid, but it donates two protons. So the normality is two, okay? That's not strictly speaking right because that second proton doesn't completely dissociate, but it's close enough that we can call it two, et cetera. And so you need to be familiar with this. The chapter by Siegel goes over all of this again. Okay. Um, a reminder of logarithms, which we just went through. Okay. So the log of B is equal to the log of 10 to the A. So the log of B is A because it's the log of 10 to the A. The A comes down. That was used in the stuff raised to the minus one. The log of a product is the sum of the logs. Okay. Shown here. The log of a quotient is the difference of the logs, A minus B, A example is shown here, okay? The log of A to the N is N times the log of A. Again, that's a reminder. <clears throat> this is all how you write down equilibrium constants, C times D over A times B will get you an equilibrium constant. It also is reflected in the ratio of the forward and reverse rate constants, <clears throat> okay? And so, the forward and reverse rate constants would correspond to that species and that species, forward and reverse, okay? These are bimolecular rate constants, okay? And so that's where they're coming from, okay? If you have different stoichiometries, then you raise those to the cube or to the square, 3C is C cubed, 2a is a squared, et cetera, okay? Um, we get into in this a summary of what we'll talk about later. We talked about this in the course in terms of free energy, in terms of concentrations, okay? And so this is part of what we're writing up in the thermodynamics section. We'll get to this in a couple of weeks, all right? In more detail, if this is an equilibrium, then that expression becomes an equilibrium constant and we can write this down <clears throat> under equilibrium conditions, okay? And then this is sort of a relationship between free energies and equilibrium constants, but it's basically a table showing you as K varies, how does G vary? And it varies with minus 2.303 RT. Um, this expression involves the logarithm right, the natural logarithm, excuse me. And so the natural logarithm is equal to 2.303 log base 10. You remember that from our previous work, or you remember that from some undergraduate or high school class. <clears throat> we'll talk about electrostatics and the attraction that molecules have for one another. It usually involves the energy involves the attraction of oppositely charged molecules separated by a distance, okay? So if these molecules are separated by some distance, what is the energy between those two molecules? If, for example, they're oppositely charged, that's the charge on an electron. So that creates the proper units. And then this is a dielectric constant. It has something to do with the medium through which these charges see one another. So if you have a plus and a minus charge separated by some distance, how strongly do they attract or how strongly do they repel? Okay, depends upon the solution in between. If this is water, then the dielectric constant of water is 78 approximately at 25 degrees. And so divided by 78, this will be weak. If the dielectric between them is an interior of a protein, then this dielectric constant might be two. And then this attraction might be much stronger, okay? Or the repulsion might be much stronger, okay? Depending on what that dielectric media is. And remember why that might be, and we'll come back to this. 
that the water in between them is oriented to protect these charges so that they don't actually see one another. What they see is that the, bi the dipoles in between them due to water, for example. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the dipole moment refers to uh, along a molecule that is polarized, um, what the direction of that dipole is. I think I asked you a question later in the course. If you have a water molecule, and it has a net dipole, okay? How big is the net dipole? The electron pairs are over here. So there's a net negative charge, a net positive charge. How big is that net dipole, okay? In terms of units that might be convertible to energy, okay? And the problem is, is that the dipole is actually coming from those interactions and you basically have to project those onto that axis to get what the net dipole is in this direction. So there's some geometry and algebra that has to be done to make this projection correct. Okay, and there's a discussion in here about how this might be important um, in terms of electric fields or by other molecules and how all of this can be discussed. Now, I say that this will be discussed in chapter eight. That refers to chapter eight of a textbook by Stryer. <clears throat> we got into this in terms of enzymes, et cetera, in that course. Um, it's not discussed directly in Lippincott's, but you and I will discuss this later on in the course. And then here's a discussion of hydrogen bonding. So it's a different way of listening about what I've already said. Here's a discussion of van der Waals contacts. Here's an equation referred to here is the Leonard Jones potential. Okay, so the Leonard Jones potential here can be written as something to the minus six plus something to the minus 12. This on an energy diagram tends to look like this. So it has a well where there's an attraction. And then once it gets too close, there's a repulsion, okay? And so this is the general equation for how two molecules approach one another, attract at their van der Waals contact distance, okay? That's what this is referring to. But if they get too close, they repel. And so if you plot this equation with some value of A and some value of B, this is the plot. And that point right there is the van der Waals contact distance, okay? And so I'm saying here, what does a plot like this look like? I'm just showing you what it looks like. Later in the course, I'll have you calculate some of these distances by solving this problem by taking a derivative, okay? Here's a discussion of hydrophobic interactions. So I've already discussed this here. You and I will discuss this again later but here's an introduction to it for your purposes. And then we get into the same topics that we just covered, okay? It gets into dissociation, it gets into water, it gets into acidic solutions being less than pH seven, being basic solutions greater. It's a derivation of Henderson-Hasselbach after we discussed pH. It introduces enzyme activity, which you and I discussed in the enzymes lecture, uh, acid-base equilibria, the fact that there are strong and weak acids and bases, okay? So this is a strong acid, fully dissociated. These are weak acids, partially dissociated, and how you might solve these problems, okay, for these different kinds of interactions. All right, and so this goes through the same sort of mathematics, the same sort of discussion that we just went through, okay? Um, here, for example, it introduces you to the fact that the counter ion can actually be part of the reaction, okay? So the sodium chloride in water or the sodium acetate, the sodium becomes part of the calculation that you have to take into account there how you write down equilibrium constants, how you solve Henderson-Hasselbach. Here's that same table projected on the side. As the pH becomes more basic, 
the pOH also becomes more basic. So the pH goes to a bigger number, the hydroxide goes to a smaller number. As the solution becomes more acidic, the pH becomes a smaller number, the pOH becomes a larger number. So that the sum is always 14, the product is always 10 to the minus 14, okay? And so I'm deriving Henderson-Hasselbalch here, uh, and we're discussing how you solve these various equations and how you talk about water. This is all done in a slightly different way. Um, it may be clearer. Here's the derivation of that 2pH equation. So how you solve a reaction with 2pH. Um, there's another reaction that's derived at the end of that PowerPoint when you add a conjugate base and how you solve the pH problem for the conjugate base, and then how you do titration curves, okay? And this specifically is discussing um, amino acids here. This is all titrated in a slightly different orientation. And I've misplaced my pen. Where did I put my pen? Well, I've misplaced a pen, so I can't write. <laughs> I've lost it somewhere. <clears throat> We're going to have to go on without it. Sorry, I don't know where I've dropped it. I can't hear it if I dropped it because I have headphones on, so you can hear me more clearly. Well, I'll find it in a second. Oh, there it is, way in the back of the table. Uh, the plot was... Um, done a little differently. This was pH. This was equivalence of hydroxide. Here it's in volumes before we did it in equivalence. <clears throat> okay. And you can write the same sort of equation where that's the pK. That's 0.5. And so that ends up being the pK point right there. Okay. And so it's just flipping the axis in a slightly different way here. You can put it either way. Okay, and then this gets into the general question of buffers, which you and I will talk about in more detail next week. <clears throat> but what this series of calculations is doing is introducing you to buffers in a very explicit way. If you add acetic acid to water, what does the pH end up being? And if you go back in the PowerPoint, you'll see it's the same problem where you solve it as C naught minus X, how much dissociated, C naught minus X, how much dissociated, how much proton is produced, what's the pH, okay? And so this is dissociating this into 100 mils of water. Notice the units that we usually use are moles per liter. So if I put 0.1 moles in 100, milliliters, then this solution here in A is actually one molar because it's 0.1 moles in 100 milliliters. So the C naught now is one minus X. In that problem, it was 0.1 minus X. Okay, so the concentration becomes a variable here. It becomes more acidic if you add a higher concentration. This is just water. Okay, and so it, it's a, a calculation. And then we, we have here our mixtures, okay, where we're mixing 0.1 molar and 0.1 molar. That kind of a problem basically is pK plus the log of, here's the acid and here's the base. And so it's asking you to do the calculation with different initial concentrations. But what it's also asking you to do is notice the impact of using different units and different magnitudes on buffering capacity. You can have something that's a perfectly good buffer, but if it's such a low concentration that it lo loses all of its capacity, for example, because we're generating acid in our bodies, then it's not as good a buffer, okay? We discussed this in terms of phosphate and bicarb in the blood. Okay, there's more bicarb than phosphate, and so it's a better buffer because of that. 
okay, et cetera. So this is just a way of helping you to do calculations that might be useful in your understanding of pH and might be useful in calculations that you might use in the lab. And then it has a discussion of polyprotics and polyprotics can mean multiple things. Uh, initially, it refers to phosphates. Here's a table that looks like the table in my PowerPoint. But for example, phosphoric acid dissociates three protons. And so three protons can be dissociable and you have three equilibria that can be part of the calculation. And you can be working at pH two or pH seven or pH 12 for these types of calculations. And again, this plot has been changed so that equivalence over here, one, two, three, and pH is over here. And so the one, two, three equivalents, as you titrate, you get an equilibria here, and then you get an equilibria here, and then you get an equilibria here. And that's pK2, that's pK7, that's pK12. Okay, so it's just reorienting this to give you what it is that you need. Okay, and that's the midpoint. <clears throat> in each of these reactions. So depending on what pH you're at, depending upon what form of the phosphate you add, you can get different equilibria. This is polyprotic, but it's equivalent to a protein that might have a hundred of these dissociable protons. So it would look much more complicated and we'll talk about that later on, okay? And then this is showing the derivation of different kinds of reactions. There's the hydronium ion that I already mentioned. There's the polyprotic amino acids, okay? Um, and in previous um, courses, in other words, previous medical biochemistry, but in general, if I were to write down a plot and I tell you it's an amino acid, You could tell me that this is histidine because the midpoint is around neutral. It's approximately seven or six, and that must be a side chain of histidine. If I wrote this down as this with this and then this, then you know that that's glutamic acid or aspartic acid because the side chain is in the acidic region. And if I wrote this down as something way out here, then you know that that's arg arginine or lysine. So from the titration curve, you can tell that kind of stuff, all right? Now imagine this doing this with a protein in all of the amino acids, okay? You can actually identify a protein by the complete titration curve if you knew how many lysines, arginines, histidines, the spartic acid, glutamic acids there were, okay? It's not the ideal way to do it, but it, visually you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, this gets into bicarb and calculations with bicarb. And so I am gonna stop here for the moment. Okay, so this was calculations that we got into in the clinical part of the course. It's the same henderson hasselbach stuff that we talked about before. It's the same dissociation of CO2 with water to make carbonic acid, carbonic acid dissociating to make bicarb. And then the total equilibria is between CO2 and bicarb. And that's the equilibria that you write down when we solve the henderson hasselbach equation for carbonic acid. Uh, excuse me, for bicarb. So we use, here we go. We use the gas, CO2, and the conjugate base to solve problems for bicarb. And we use a pK of 6.1, et cetera. Okay, so if we need to, we can talk about this. So th this you can see was an old version of how we introduce pH, pH calculations, um, amino acids, and clinical components of that. So this is an old version of that. And if you read this, 
you can see what we're talking about. Okay. So I'm going to do one final thing. I'm going to close that. And I'm not going to keep all of that stuff. Close current tab. Do not save. So the other document that I'm telling you, and this is where the assignment is coming from. This is the textbook by Siegel. It's written, it's in Canvas under Siegel. It introduces you to concentrations, okay? Different units, weight concentrations, molar concentrations, how you work with weight volume calculations, okay? Um, what osmolarity means, which has biological or physiological significance, what weight concentration means, what normality means, et cetera. It's all the same topics, right? It introduces this concept of ionic strength that you and I will talk about next week, having to do with the concentrations of various charged forms. And I won't dwell on this right now because that's something we'll talk about next week. Um, but it has to do with the number of charges that are in the solution not just concentration. So here's a calculation of ionic strength. It has to do with, let's see, more concentration. So the whole first part of this is concentrations. Degrees of saturation. Um, the one place where this, I think, is being discussed here has to do with relative to the total solubility. Okay, so the place that we usually use this in was, is ammonium sulfate, all right? Um, we usually use ammonium sulfate to precipitate proteins, and we usually use the unit percent saturation. And so at a given temperature, you can get so much ammonium sulfate in solution, and you can describe the concentration as a percent of the maximum concentration, and that's what this discussion is showing. So I might want um, ammonium sulfate to be at 20% saturated. And that will be the conditions under which I precipitate something in a cell extract, okay? And so this is showing you how to do that. All right, um, we use this, uh, maybe none of you are so familiar with this, but it's a common biochemical technique. It's simply another way of talking about concentration. He introduces equilibrium constants and how you write down equilibrium constants. And notice a lot of this has to do, will have to do with weak acids. You'll notice here 2C, it has a C squared. So he's simply reviewing everything that I just went over in the PowerPoint and everything that is in that pH um, review. Okay, ionization of strong acids, ionization of water, ionization of weak acids, the definition of pH and pOH, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is a, it's long, there are lots of examples. All right, the point is, is that at the end of the chapter, There's polyprotix, <clears throat> just what I drew, showing you the different molecular forms. In this particular case, it's aspartic acid. So there are three titratable groups, et cetera. Here's another way of looking at it. Problems 148, sorry, let's... There's some stuff at the bottom having to do with hemoglobin and binding. We'll come back to that. And then at the very, very prob bottom of pro problem one or chapter one are questions. Okay. And so I mentioned a little while ago that the assignment will involve these questions. Okay. Let me just pull that up again because I think I erased it. So the first assignment, I'll post this now or I'll email it to you now. And these are the questions that I want you to go through. So let's admit that what I'm asking you to do, what I'm asking you to do is read that chapter on your own and solve those problems. And so what I'm asking you to do is do this independently. Now I'm going to stop sharing at the moment. I'm asking you to learn that on your own. It's a, basically a repeat of what I've already covered. 
It's a repeat of what I just covered twice, although the second one is very quick, okay? It's stuff that you in principle should be familiar with, how to do concentrations, how to convert from milli to micro to nano, et cetera, um, how to solve and write down equilibrium constants, how to solve Henderson-Hasselbach, all of these things. What this is really doing is it's reviewing math skills. It's reviewing biochemical concepts. It's reviewing things that you should be familiar with. Uh, hopefully you've been a little bit bored. I'm sorry to say that, but maybe you've been a little bit bored because you know all of this stuff, okay? Partially I did this because I wasn't sure how this was gonna work. And we're gonna discuss that, how well it works. Um, partially I'm doing this to kind of reiterate that there's gonna be a lot of math in this class, all right? And so I want your skills to be sort of practiced, okay? So next week you can see in Canvas, I think I've erased, I've closed that window, maybe not. Yeah, next week we'll cover Primarily these two papers at the top, the goods paper and the, the magnesium ATP paper. Okay, and so in terms of preparing by next week, if you look at those, you'll be far ahead of the game. And then I'll give you another assignment at the same time. So I'm gonna put that assignment right here and I'm gonna add it to this list so that you have access to it. Um, and then I may also email it to you initially. You know, I think in the past, uh, when I have taught this course and I don't always use Canvas, I usually communicate by emails, okay? And so I'll send you the assignment by email. And I usually ask you to complete everything. Uh, oh, I was just showing you something in Canvas and you couldn't see my screen, sorry. It'll be in the same folder as lecture one, okay. Uh, I usually give you an assignment date when I put it in the schedule. If you're having trouble finishing for some reason, just ask for more time, okay? No problems, okay? I don't like to grade these papers. And so if you don't give me your paper, I don't grade it yet, okay? But eventually we have to grade all of them. And so, you know, if you need more days, if you need another week, et cetera, okay? So that's time. That's actually 10 minutes to go. You'll notice I lectured or I spoke for an hour and 50 minutes. <clears throat> okay. I always speak for an hour and 50 minutes. I think you have something at 12 today, don't you? No, there's nothing at 12. We're assuming that there's something at 12. I don't know that there always is on Tuesday. Maybe it's on Thursday that you have something at 12. Is that right? Again, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but I'll generally try to stop at this time uh, for every lecture. If you need a break, you need to speak up, okay? I can probably go for three hours in this format, and I usually would, so you have to object, okay? I prefer to get through as much material as we can in an hour and 50 minutes, um, and so you need to say something if there's a problem. So, before we stop, <clears throat> give me feedback. Were there any problems in that using Zoom, what I was writing? I often am using the pointer or the cursor as though you can see it. Can you see my cursor? A lot of nodding, yes, and some stares. Okay. Yes, we, we, we saw your cursor. Okay, Just... sometimes I also use the point of the pen as though you can see it, it's a small dot. Uh, mm -hmm. When I write with it, obviously, you can see it, okay? Anything else? The hearing hopefully works because I'm using a micro, I'm using a headphone with a, with a, a mic. There's less yes. noise. Yes. Is there something else? No, I'm good. <laughs> Anybody else have a comment? I think everything worked great. We could, I could hear you clearly the whole time. I could follow your cursor and the uh, and your annotations with the a stylus. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is uh, I'm going to stop the recording.